The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond and platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Hello, hello. So, I think it's. Oh. This work? Yeah, okay. Should I make the print bigger? You guys in the back ready? Hello, I love Ruby. Hello, hello. We're gonna talk about Ruby today, now, soon. We're gonna talk about Ruby, my favorite language, okay. 
Well, hello, everybody. We're finally ready to begin. And I'm going to talk about my favorite language, Ruby. I have a little slideshow prepared on my Mac, but I'm running my Ubuntu VM on the Mac. Um, uh, first of all, I'm a software developer. I live in the Washington, D.C. area. I've done a lot of Java work, and before that, C++, and before that, C. Now I'm into Ruby, a little bit of Android. I have some other interests as well. And just so we can have a little bit of levity here. A DBA walks into a bar, steps in front of two tables, and says, anybody? May I join you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I'll make this full screen. And so ask me to slow down if you need me to. Uh, ask questions if you have something that you are confused about. Feel free to share your own observations. Um, an overview of what I love about Ruby is I came from about 10 years of Java development. And you know, in the end, it was so painful. I was doing anything I could to avoid it, trying to sneak Ruby into my work through unit testing or, or scripting or um, things like that. Um, what I love about Ruby includes uh, its conciseness and clarity. It's very concise. There are other languages that are concise, but they're not necessarily clear. Ruby is both. Um, devoid of ceremony. Ceremony is the kind of the it's a low signal to noise ratio. It's the presence of code that you have to write to get the language to do something that really has nothing to do with the business problem and feels unnecessary. There's a lot of that with Java, and um, I'll get into that. Expressive syntax. You can write Ruby in such a way that the reader can intuit what it is that you mean. Powerful enumerable processing. There are many functions that you can call on enumerables, such as arrays, that make your work much clearer um, and more succinct and make the language much more powerful. Code blocks and closures. Code blocks are little fragments of code that you can pass to a function, you can pass around. Closures are code blocks which carry with them the context in which they were created. So you can create a code block that says puts foo, the variable foo, not quotes, the variable foo. And you can pass that to a function, and that function will know what foo is, even though it wasn't defined in its scope. And that's how a closure is kind of a subset of a code block, and both are supported in Ruby. Everything is an object in Ruby, even one, even nil, even true and false. They're all objects. Ranges. Ranges are first class objects. You can define a range and put it literally in your code and, and use it. You can pass it to a function. Regular expressions are also first class objects that you can express as literals, which is very handy. And by the way, I realize that I'm at a Linux conference and a lot of you guys are into Perl and Python. So forgive me if you know this stuff is, is not, you know, I, I know that a lot of this stuff is also common to Python and Perl, um, but I'm not really very familiar with those. So. I'm just telling you what I love about Ruby, and it's maybe what I would love about Python and Perl as well. Um, JRuby is an implementation of Ruby that runs on a Java virtual machine. And this can be really powerful for many reasons. Um, first of all, Java can perform better than the native C Ruby because it has a hotspot compiler. Um, while a Java program is running, the Java virtual machine is watching it to see what it's doing. And if it does the same thing 10,000 times, it figures out a way, or sometimes figures out a way, to do it more quickly and bypass steps and, and um, save time that way. Also, you have access to a multitude of Java libraries that are out there. Another reason JRuby can be handy is there are a lot of shops that would be very resistant to bringing in a new language and all the, the installation and administration overhead. JRuby comes to you in the form of a single jar file. Of course, you have to have a Java um, runtime on your machine. But basically, it's one jar file that you can install and then use. Um, IRB. Uh, IRB is an in interactive shell in which you can run Ruby. And it's very handy for testing concepts out, um, testing minimal things out, and, and experimenting with the language. Um, and we'll see some more of that later. Uh, OS scripting support. 
Um, I use Ruby as a shell scripting language sometimes. And um, I'm not really that familiar with shell scripting, you know, the regular shell scripting. But it's an awesome shell scripting language. And you'll see a little bit of that later, too. Okay. So I have some examples. And I'm sorry about the screen. It's a little bit cut off of the verbosity of Java versus the conciseness of Ruby. And here's one example. Um, the Java program that you would have to write to just print to the screen, hello world. Look at that. There are so many things about it that are, are inscrutable to the, the beginning user. What is public? What is static? What is void? You know, and what is the meaning of main? Uh, in Ruby, you can just say puts hello world. Um, I'm going to change this a little bit and see if it works better. OK, I think that's better. Um, another thing in Java that's really frustrating is that you have to define your getters and setters. You don't have to do that in Ruby. Ruby has metaprogramming, which allows you to create functions on the fly. And so what you have here is attribute accessor. Under the covers, it's really a function. And you're passing it a symbol, which is kind of like a string interned, an interned string. And what it does is it defines a getter function and a setter function for that property. It does all that for you. Here's a case of subtracting one array from another. It's amazing how verbose you have to be in Java. Um, the top is Java and the bottom is Ruby. In Ruby, you can just say one array minus another array. By the way, how many of you folks are Java developers? Probably this, OK. So this isn't really relevant to too many of you, but uh, I'll pass through this quickly. Um, here's another case where you're just defining a function that returns a list that doubles the original list. And another example of uh, Ruby's conciseness and clarity, other than the new block syntax, which might be a little confusing at first. Multi-line strings. It's very easy to define a multi-line string. And if you use double quotes in Ruby, then the string um, will substitute values that it sees in pound curly brace for the result of the expression within those braces. And so this is a template um, that uh, can be evaluated. And in Java, you have to define each string literal individually for each line. And um, so this is much easier to work with. And uh, you can put any arbitrary function in there. Um, Mots, the guy who wrote Ruby, um, he tried to make it really clear. He took it from um, parts from C, parts from Perl, parts from Smalltalk. But he thought, well, what would I like to see in a language? And so there are a lot of things in Ruby that are just there because it's kind of like, well, this, this makes sense to me. This makes it simple to use. So because numbers, number literals, are objects, you can do stuff like this. You can say three dot times and then pass it a block. And then that block will be executed three times. Um, arrays can be defined either this way, or if, if they're words separated by spaces, there's a shortcut. You can do it this way. Um, you have hashes. So uh, these are key value pairs. You have negative subscripting, which will subscript from the end of the array backwards, which can be handy. And there are also convenience functions, like first and last for uh, arrays. And we went uh, over the attribute accessor. Another nice touch is that um, once, every, once or twice a year, I come up with a situation where I have to define a, a numeric literal that's really long, like a million or 10 million or something like that. And um, I always break it down into like 1,000 times 1,000, because I know that it's not going to be, a, you know, it's only going to be a negligible cost, but it's going to make it a lot more readable. Well, you don't have to do that in Ruby. You can just use under, underscores as 1,000 separators. And when Ruby sees those, it'll just throw them away. So it's just another nice touch. Any questions so far? Can you just go to IRB? Sure. Good, yeah. It's good to go to IRB a lot. So um, let's go to IRB here. And we can see that this is defined. It's, it's, IRB will show you the result of the expression on the line after you've typed it. So whatever this expression evaluates to, 
will be displayed. Um, if I ask it wh what is the class of this thing, it'll show me that it's a fixed num. Now the um, underscores are kind of arbitrary. You can put them anywhere you want, even where they don't make sense. And um, they will be ignored. They're just totally ignored. Um, okay, any, any other questions? Okay, so I was talking about ranges before. So we have this range here where we have one to 12. You can convert, <clears throat> a lot of objects can be converted to arrays. If it makes sense that one can convert this object to an array, then the author of the class will write a 2A function and arrays are no exception. You can create, you can convert a range to an array and that can be handy. Um, another, I talked about enumerable processing before. We have here the map function, which is really, really powerful. And what the map function does is it says, with this enumerable that I'm calling the map function on, return an array uh, for which each new element, in the, each element in the new array will take the old array and then apply this expression to it. So what this is doing here is it's saying, take the nums as the input array, and for each element in it, call it n, and perform this, evaluate this expression on it. So what this returns is an array, I'm sorry, what? Oh, thank you. Uh-oh, I didn't do it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, gosh, how did that happen? <laughs> Anyway, um, so as you see, you're, you're getting, uh, oh, this isn't doubling, I'm sorry, it's squaring it. So this is returning an array, same size as the original array. Mm. <laughs> same size as the original array, um, but squares. Um, array subtraction, okay, so we ha we're getting the, the even. Let's see. Here it's good. Yeah, but it's snug. Well, let's try that. <laughs> so we've seen the squares. To get the even numbers, we're taking the input array and calling the select function, which filters the input array and only allows into the output array those elements for which the expression evaluates to true. So the expression is the number in the input array mod two should equal zero. So it'll only let the even numbers in. And to get the odd numbers, we can just subtract the even numbers from all the numbers. That's one way we can do it. We could also, of course, do equals one instead of equals zero. Another enumerable function that can be really powerful is inject. Inject will create a single value from the input array. And you, um, you have a, an executable piece of code that carries a value with it through each iteration and um, does something useful for you. Uh, in this case, we're just getting a sum. And so um, we have a sum and we're just adding to the sum at each iteration. I'm gonna to touch this very carefully. Uh, functions can have code blocks passed to them. This was kind of weird for me at first. You can pass a code block to a function and the function can execute that code block on your behalf. It does so using the yield keyword. Um, and the mechanics are a little bit confusing at first, but once you've done it a little bit, it gets a lot easier to understand. Here's an example of a function and this def is the beginning of a function definition. So we're defining a function named foo, 
And uh, it's just going to be this one line because this end terminates the function definition. And in the function, we're saying, is, was a block given to me? If so, then yield, that is, execute it. If not, then just put to the standard out, no block given. It's very simple, but it, it illustrates to you the power of your functions can behave differently depending on whether or not a block has been passed to it. So here's an example of passing a block to that function, and it executes the code that you passed it, or not passing a code block to it. Everybody okay so far? Okay. Yes. Um, Ruby has a special convenience whereby um, if a block is the last argument, it's not a named argument. Um, you could, of course, create a code block, assign it to a variable, and pass it as any other argument if you wanted to. Um, so, and as I mentioned before, closures are a subset of code blocks, and, and closures carry the scope with them. So here, I'm defining a variable name that has the value Joe, and saying, hi, Joe, three times. Now, what's happening here is that the times function of the object three is being called with a code block. So if you think about it, usually inside a class method somewhere, you don't have scope to somebody else's stack, right? But what Ruby does is it passes a binding which has a lot of information about the context of where the code block was created so that in the function, it has access to that variable. And this is one of my favorite features of, of code blocks. It's just awesome because in your programming, how many times have you had to really be concerned about, am I closing all the files I'm opening? Am I releasing all the resources I'm allocating? Um, using this block mechanism, you can guarantee it. So you don't have to think about it anymore. Um, the Ruby file that open command, if you pass it a block, this is the block that you want it to execute with the open file. It will open the file for you, pass the file handle to your block so you can do whatever you want to do with that file, and then close the file for you. And it's calling block given so that if you don't pass it a block, it says, oh, I guess you just want a file handle. And it gives you a file handle, and you do what you want with it, and you close it yourself. Um, but this is really cool. I, I think so anyway. Um, and in, in when I use Ruby for kind of shell scripting, I use the dir.changedir function, which does a similar thing. It changes to the name directory, performs the code in your code block, and then pops back to the directory that you began in. Yeah. Yes. Yes. They're, they're synonyms. Um, the convention in Ruby is that if your code fits on a single line, you use the curly braces. If it doesn't, you use do end. But yeah, they're really the same, same thing. So as I mentioned before, everything is an object. And here are some examples. So number one, this is an empty array. This is an empty hash. This is an empty regular expression. Uh, so this is self, which if you're familiar with object, if you know another object-oriented programming language, I'm sure you have something like it that might be called this. Um, and of course, it can represent a different class depending on the context. Uh, nil is a class, a range is a class. So here is something about ranges. Um, you can convert them to arrays, as we mentioned. If you use three dots instead of two, then it'll exclude the higher bound, which is handy for those minus one situations where you have to say for i equals zero to something minus one. You don't have to do that anymore. You can just use the three dot range. And um, you can also slice an array um, and you can, you, you, you can pass a, a range to slice that array. And um, regular expressions, you can use, you can specify a regular expression as a literal. You don't have to assign it to a variable first. Um, this operator here, the equal tilde, returns an index into the string of the first occurrence of the regular expression, or nil if it doesn't occur. Uh, the triple equal returns a true or false 
true if the regular expression matches at all, false if it doesn't at all. And um, we'll see later, there, there's a way to use this in a case statement that's very concise and readable. So here we have a sample array. We're defining an array with a percent W. And we're grepping the array for strings that begin with P. And we get this result. Um, and we're doing the same thing here, but we're assigning the regular expression to a variable first. Okay. And here's an example using the triple equals. You do regex triple equals string. Now, the way operators are in Ruby is that most of them are function calls. And so you can, like C++, you can override these operators. Um, and of course, that can be dangerous. Uh, so you need to use them with care. Because of that, if you would re reverse the arguments and say peach triple equals regular expression, carrot p, you get a different result, probably an error, um, or maybe a false. But anyway, um, those operators are bound to the thing to the left of them. So this would execute the triple equals function on the regular expression. Um, and so we have a true and a false example. Um, here we get the number or the nil for this operator here. And here we have a case statement. It's not really that interesting, but we say case word, and then it, when you have a when expression, it looks to see if the regular expression in the when matches the word. And you have else's and that kind of thing. Um, and here's an example of using that. JRuby. JRuby is really cool. Um, I mentioned some of the reasons that I like it. Um, it can be a better Java than Java in that, for example, you can run Java in your IRB shell using JRuby. Um, and uh, I'll show you an example of that later. You can unit test Java code with JRuby. Um, one of the, in my previous jobs, I was working with Java and I, I used Ruby to create a crude library to access an Oracle database. And I knew that I didn't have a whole lot of objects so they would fit in memory. And, and so um, I could pull objects into a Ruby array and then manipulate them and then do do things that would just be too difficult to do with SQL plus or, you know, the conventional Java JDBC thing. It, it was just, would have been really awkward. So Ruby was very helpful in that case. JRubyComplete.jar is a single file that has JRuby itself plus some of the executables that go along with the Ruby environment. Jam, IRB, Rake, RDoc, and RI. Um, and I haven't looked this up, but I think they removed one or two of these from the most recent version. But anyway, what it means is that you can just copy that one file somewhere and then um, run those executables from the jar. It's kind of a self-contained Ruby. Um, and in that sense, it's much, much easier to install than um, a regular Ruby, as long as you have a JVM on your system, Java runtime. So here's an example of using JRuby. Um, as a Java shell. The locale, um, one of the other benefits of using JRuby is that it has very good internationalization support. So uh, if, if you wanna do something that you're gonna be distributing to other countries or, you know, or, and or other languages, um, it's really good. I mean, it has a way to um, substitute different strings, of course, but it also has a lot of numeric formats, date formats, currency formats, that kind of thing. So uh, this is a way to display each locale that the, the JVM supports. Um, and here's a way to print out the system properties. So uh, we mentioned shell scripting. Here's a, what you could do on the Unix command line using find. Ruby lets you, as in shell scripting, put backticks around something and will return to you the standard out that was produced by that command. Of course, it'll execute it, but it also returns you the standard out. Um, and that can be really handy. So here's a way you might um, delete all the 
under, uh, .temp files in uh, a directory tree. You can do that, but if you have any concern about portability, uh, especially if you have to support Windows systems, um, you can do that in Ruby instead. So Ruby has a lot of functions that mimic the um, Unix functions, and dir.glob will do a directory, um, and there are various file functions like delete. You may have heard about metaprogramming. Um, using metaprogramming, you can, you can use Ruby to create other languages. Um, Puppet, I guess, was written in Ruby. It's a domain-specific language that was written in Ruby. Um, and there are certain features that a language has to have, metaprogramming meta capabilities, in order to create such a DSL. Um, Ruby, for example, can create functions on the fly, can create classes. Um, and, um, well, as we saw, the attribute accessor creates functions for you. The method missing, that Ruby will let you catch a method missing exception and handle it. Whereas with most languages, if you call a method that doesn't exist on the object that you're calling it on, it's just an error. That's it, you're done. But with Ruby, if your class contains a method missing function, a function name, method missing, um, it gets two arguments. It gets the function name that was called and then the list of arguments that were passed to it. With that information, you can do whatever you want. You can just handle those things right there. In other words, you can just do the things that the user intended to do, or you can define a function that does those things for the next time around and then call it, or you can say, well, this doesn't make sense and raise an error. So you have a lot of flexibility there, and that in particular is something that makes Ruby very powerful. Um, Rails is a domain-specific language for Ruby. It makes heavy use of stuff like this. Um, Active Record, which is a component of Rails, um, lets you access a database uh, record fields by name and Rails, Active Record will, it'll find out what that really means in the context of that record and it'll do the right thing. So um, this is a very powerful concept. And um, there are other uh, uses of that too, like there are XML builders where you can um, call a method, you can have an XML builder object and then call a method on it, which is really the element name. And then underneath, it'll method missing on catch that and say, oh, okay, this is an element name. I'm gonna create an element of this name here and I'll do that for you. Now, I wanna show you something that, um, oh, I guess I have one more slide. What does that say? Oh, the end, but it's not the end. I have more. <laughs> um, I wanted to show you something that is really cool. I think it's really cool anyway. Um, there is a gem for Ruby called Sinatra. Sinatra is a minimal, uh, Sinatra is a very minimal web uh, server, uh, web framework, although it's, it's tiny, it's a tiny thing. That's a program right there, from require to end, that is a program that you can access with your web browser and see hello world. That's all you need to do. Um, and that is beauty because it means that the, 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 the cost of creating something that responds to a, a web client or, or a curl client or you know, a web services client is so small that you can now do lots more stuff like that that was previously prohibitively expensive to do. So just for kicks, I put this, this little thing together. Um, this is really small. Let me do it another way. Wow. Oh, there we go. Okay, well this is like the one that you saw on the screen, but I'll show you another one that's better. Forget about this. <laughs> okay. 
Can you see this? Yeah? Okay. So this is a simple, simple thing that is going to get us the users on a Unix system and the uptime. And if it's in Java, it's going to show us, if, if we're running JRuby, it'll show us the languages that are supported by, by the runtime. So let's run it, see what happens. So first I'm going to see which Ruby I have started. Let me talk about RVM a little bit. If you decide that you would like to use Ruby, and you would like to have some flexibility as to which Ruby distributions to use, I highly recommend RVM. It runs on any Unix, including Mac OS and uh, Linux and all kinds of Unices, not on Windows. RVM lets you easily install and manage many different um, distributions of Ruby. As you can see here, I have, I have four of them. Um, RE is the Ruby Enterprise Edition, which is kind of a souped up, um, better supported Ruby 1.8. Um, Ruby 1.9.2 is, is the latest or close to the latest Ruby that's out there. And 1.9 is significantly different from 1.8, so you have to think about which one you want to use. Um, JRuby is the Ruby that runs on the JVM. And then Ruby 1.8 is, is the plain vanilla Ruby that sometimes we call it MRI Ruby, a MOTS Ruby uh, implementation, I guess. Um, so using, using uh, RVM, you can easily switch back and forth. So if I were to say JRuby and then list them, it would show me that I have switched. Now, this might not seem that special to you, but if you try doing this without RVM, <laughs> it would be a big deal. <laughs> um, and this does things like it'll change the value of your gem home to point to a different thing. Um, it creates a .rvm directory in, in your home directory, which contains all of these Ruby implementations, the gems for, all, for each implementation, and they're separate. They have to be because many of them are, are natively compiled, and for JRuby, that doesn't always work, and vice versa. So anyway, RVM is good. Um, and it's, it's pretty easy to install, too. Very easy to work with. Uh, so we were going to run that program. I must be in JRuby here because it's taking a long time. Yeah, <laughs> see it says here Java. Um, so let's point our browser here. And let's try the users. Okay, so we have a list of the users on, on the server, on the OS that the server is running on. Okay, now let me show you the code that produced that because it's surprisingly small. It's this one line. Uh, let me see if I can make the text bigger for you. So we just read from left to right, and it's not so bad, okay? The file class has a method read lines, which reads the contents of the file into an array of lines. So each line is, is one string element in an array. And we're reading this file, and then we're sorting it, defaulting to alphabetically. And then on the resulting array, we're calling the map function. Remember what that does? Anybody? Yes, it'll produce a new array um, with the elements of the input array uh, applying that, that block to the elements of the input array. Okay, so what is it doing? It's splitting that line um, using the colon as a separator and then getting the first thing in the resulting array. So in the SC password, you have name, doc, name colon and a bunch of other things. So that's all you have to do in Ruby to get the, uh, the users. A lot, it, it can be very dense but yet fairly readable once you get over that code block thing. Um, and then here we have that, we talked about the um, multi-line string literal. This is the multi-line string, string literal and we just, it's a template and 
uh, we take that array of users and we join them with the HTML break and line breaks. Um, similarly, we can just, we can just run um, a Unix command and using the backticks we get the standard out. So if we test that out, we will get what you would expect to get. Now, this doesn't seem like a, that big a deal, but the reason that I think it's a big deal is that it's so easy to do that if you have a one-off thing that you need to do, and you know some machine is doing something somewhere, and because this is Ruby, I mean, you have ultimate flexibility. You can, you can test for certain conditions and email out to someone to do this and that. Um, of course, you know, if, if you have a serious thing that's repeated many times, you would probably want to use something like Puppet or something more, you know. Um, but um, for one-off things, this is really handy. Um, so I'll show you then um, the languages one too. Okay, so let's see what we had to do to get that. When you program JRuby and you want to use something from Java, you have to say require Java. And then you have access to the Java uh, libraries and classes. So this is just saying, on the Java util locale Java class, call the class method get available locales um, and convert it to an array. I don't remember why that was necessary, I think. Oh, because it returns a Java array, not a Ruby array. And um, I had trouble calling the enumerables on a Java array. So I just used 2A to convert that to a, a Ruby array. So once in a while you have these Java Ruby integration issues you have to figure out. Um, and then on that list of languages, uh, I'm sorry, on that list of locales, extract the languages. Um, and there are language codes, ISO codes for languages, but there are also display languages, display strings. So we get the display, language, uh, display languages, and we sort them, and then we call unique on them. So you see, you have a lot of Unix-like things um, that you can use in, um, in Ruby. And in fact, Mott's, he, he, I believe he's using Linux as his main development language. So uh, he's very Linux friendly. And um, in Ruby, the, the last expression in a function is the thing that gets returned. So you won't see any explicit return keywords unless it's a Java programmer who wrote it. <laughs> then you might see it. <laughs> of course, you may see it if, if it's further up in the function, if it's, you know, but um, yeah, generally if you see a return statement, you know, mm, Java programmer wrote that. So this is the last expression in the function, and this is what has been returned. Uh, we're just taking the array of languages and joining them with the HTML break. Any questions? Um, yeah. It includes, it, it's not really including any particular packages, it's including the Java integration. Oh. So once you do the required Java, you can get to anything that's available oh. through your JVM. Okay. Yeah. A block is, is kind of a, it's like a function, except it's not named and it's not a function object. It's kind of a little different. And are these inside gems, for example? Gems, thanks for mentioning that. That's important. Gems are basically libraries of Ruby code, um, like jar files in Java or Perl has CPAN where you can get stuff, right? It's, that, that's really what a gem is. If you have code that you think will be usable in other applications, more than one application, then it's a good idea to put it in a gem. And in a gem, you can specify dependencies on other libraries. You can specify version versions that it's dependent on. And it makes it very easy to, to pass around to other people. And the, um, in the Ruby world, um, people use GitHub an awful lot. And there's just, um, uh, well, there's, there's GitHub, there's Ruby gem, uh, I'm sorry, Ruby Forge. Uh, which is a kind of a dispenser of gems. Um, 
but th there's just a lot of support for, for gems and it, it's, it's a good way to package your code. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with any particular kind of code, it's any code at all. Rails is packaged in the form of gems, for example. Any other questions? Anybody want to try something? Brian, you look like you're up for adventure. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Well, um, is there anything you'd like to try in IRB? Because IRB is really cool. Um, uh, oh, look at that. Oh, because I'm already in IRB. Yes, IRB is the, is the Ruby interactive shell. Um, and if you are studying Ruby, it's a good idea to use it a lot because you can, if you can boil your question down to a single code fragment or a line or two of code, it's so, so easy to do it in IRB as opposed to writing something and running it. Um, so like, for example, I, I recently had a question, well, how would I extract the .xml from the end of a file spec? Like, what's the exact syntax? Because I often, you know, have off by one error. So for example, um, we can do that, and then would it be this? Or would it be that? <laughs> um, any guesses? Whoa, oh, you know why? Because I forgot the minus sign. There. So, I mean, just, Going to IRB to get information like that as opposed to trying to run your program with it either way is a really good idea. And it's one reason why Ruby programming is, is just a lot more productive than programming in a language like Java because it's just the ceremony and overhead of Java is just crazy. But if you have to use Java, you should use Ruby too. So I'll show you how if I were to change to JRuby and then I run IRB, and you'll see that it takes longer to start up because JVM takes a while. Um, so is it import Java util locale? Okay, and let's get the locales that are available. Uh, I think I don't need to specify the java.util. And JRuby will convert the camel case Java functions to snake case for you. So in Java, it's this. And you can call it that way if you want to, but you can also call it like this. Because Ruby developers are very fond of snake case and um, don't like to do it any other way. So now we have a list of, list of locales and when you're here, like, let's say you have this library, that you, Java library, you have to learn about. You know, there are objects you can call, you can get a list of stuff. Um, by the way, this, you'll notice, is not a Ruby array. Uh, if I do this, I can do, I get that. But if I do this, oh, what do you know? This is an interesting point. JRuby is migrating slowly but surely to Ruby 1.9. Um, and it's been kind of difficult. They have to work really hard to support Java. And, and um, so I forget what the replacement for that is because I'm always using 1.8. But anyway, I guess it worked. Um, and so here you could say um, map. And the way this, this notation works, and this was hard for me at first to get through is um, the curly brace defines the beginning of a code block and what's in those vertical bars is nothing more than the naming of the parameters that the code block gets. You're just saying the thing that you're going to get, call it locale, that's its name. Okay, so let's get the display language codes. Um, uh, 
Um, I, I think it's just that I don't remember the, the locale function name. So I think I have it. Do I have it here? Um, Java retail locale API. Oh, I forgot to start my internet going. Anyway, um, let's forget about that. But um, yeah, it says undefined method get language. So you know, somewhere there's a um, there's a function that ooh. There are a number of functions you can call on the locale class. It's just pretty cool. I used to do internationalization, and it was kind of interesting. So, yes, good. Okay, so give me a class name. Locale. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> good thinking. <laughs> I like the way he thinks. <laughs> um, let's see if it can do it on a Java. Uh, um, actually, it would be instance methods. And I like to sort them. Hmm. If you were to do this. Oh, wait a minute. I'm in that question mark thing. Sometimes when, you, when you're working with IRB, it gets into a kind of pushes onto a stack kind of thing. Let's try it again. Require Java. Okay, and aha, good thinking. So get display name, get language. Oh, I guess get country. To get the code, you just say get the thing, like country or language. That was my mistake. So if I were to say locales, equals locale dot, and the dot operator is for functions, but it uses the C++ double colon for variables, if they're class variables as opposed to instance variables. So let's get available locales, and then locales, oh, let's see, uh, countries, or let's say country codes, equals locales dot map, Locale, locale dot get country, and we'll use the Ruby snake case. There we go. So we got country codes there, and is it country name? I forget. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but I guess it would be languages too. Same thing. Yeah, so um, now remember too that we're in um, we're in IRB, and that's why you see these values printed here because it's printing the the evaluation of the expression that we've typed here. Um, something that's surprising to beginners is if I do puts hello, it puts hello, but then it says nil, and the nil is like, well, what's nil? Well, puts returns nil. Puts as a function, it returns nil. <laughs> so that's why, yeah. In IRB? Yeah. Probably, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, you know what I do in a case like that? This is what I do. <laughs> it works. The semicolon operator in Ruby will let you execute another command on the same line. Um, and that can be handy sometimes. Sometimes if, if something's really, really minimal, I'll, I'll do it on one line instead of multiple lines, but that's you know usually to be avoided. Uh, okay. Are there any questions? Anything you'd like to see? Can you be more specific, scale how?
Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, Ruby, like Java and so many languages, is not really very good for concurrent processing, um, as are languages like Haskell and Erlang and Clojure. Um, Ruby 1.8 supports threads. Ruby 1.9 has improved. They have what they call fibers, I believe, which are better, but I don't really know the details. I like, for that kind of job, using JRuby. Because using JRuby, you have access to Java threads, and the JVM has been tuned and optimized to death. You know, I mean, they've been working on that thing for years. And um, so you have access to Java threads. Um, you have access to profiling tools. Um, there's a tool called JVisual VM that comes with Java distributions where you can just run it and watch a program. And you can see the threads and you know you can get a lot of runtime information about it. And it's just free, it comes with a program. So if you're doing anything that's multi-threaded and you're having any kind of situation, even if you're doing something in Ruby that's multi-threaded and you're having some threading problems, it might be worthwhile to run it in JRuby and observe it with JVisual VM to see what, because it'll show you if the threads are stopped, if they're running, if they're waiting, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's really handy. I mean, J, JRuby is kind of like a, the forgotten child of the Ruby world, you know, but a lot, because Ruby, the Ruby culture has this anti-enterprise orientation, you know, they, um, and so they kind of look down on Java, but um, I have a huge amount of respect for the developers of JRuby. They're working, they're really brilliant, and they're doing a great job. And, and although, obviously, as you've heard me say it, you know, I despise the Java language as a language, I have a lot of respect for the JVM. And I think it's a great platform because I really value portability. You know, I use Linux a lot. I use Mac OS a lot. I don't use Windows <laughs> um, unless I really, really have to. Um, but Java gives you that. I mean, Ruby gives you that too, but Java gives you that too. And, um, uh, and a lot of the problems of heavy duty computing have been really, the, a lot of time and energy and money have gone into them in the Java world. So using JRuby, you can exploit that. Anything else? Well, thanks for coming, I appreciate your time. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.